Hey folks, in our uh, last lecture where we were talking about the Black Death, I kind of ended uh, a little bit on some of the changes that uh, the Black Death wrought, especially the social changes. And in this lecture, we're going to see um, basically the way things are for the next several hundred years as far as social issues in Europe. And uh, we'll see a, a little bit about you know, efforts by serfs and, and some of the commoners to push against the nobility. But we're also going to see uh, the nobility push back against some of those things. Um, and like we said in the last lecture, uh, one of the big things was that uh, society more or less breaks down during the period of um, the plague and the normal governmental structure is basically gone. Um, and so really shortly after the plague, for about 20 years, things are very much chaotic. And within about, you know, after those 20 years, there's a lot of an attempt by those in power to try to return to pre-plague ways of governing uh, over the next three decades or so, but they're really not going to work. Um, one of the big things is that the tax base is not there anymore. Um, everyone was taxed pre-plague and you know the population of Europe was somewhere around 150 million people. Well at the conclusion of the plague it's estimated we don't really unfortunately have good numbers of, of birth and death records uh, you know, to be super exact, but, you know, at the conclusion of the plague, about 75 million people out of Europe are gone. And that's a tremendous number of taxpayers that are gone. And so uh, we still have those governmental expenses, but we don't have the tax base to pay for them. So governments are going to try to raise taxes in several instances. Um, also, you know, uh, those people, the, the commoners that, you know, have, have seen their lots improved in the post-plague years, they're going to demand more of a voice in government. Uh, a lot of times that doesn't really work. Um, sometimes those groups will revolt, but we're going to see some of that. Um, and unfortunately, uh, Peasants, by and large, are illiterate. Um, it's estimated that somewhere in the neighborhood of about 90% of, of the lower classes are illiterate. And so historians don't really have a lot to go on from their side of things. Uh, and on top of that, so you've got, you know, 90% are illiterate. 10% of people are writing, uh, have the ability to write. Well, a smaller percentage of those are going to keep uh, diaries. And out of those diaries, a very small percent are going to survive, unfortunately. So, you know, we, we sort of have this narrowing of the historical record. Uh, but we do have governmental historical records uh, because the governments are going to write all this stuff and they're going to do a lot to preserve it. And so even though we don't have a lot of record from the, the, the lower classes side of things, we do have you know, a good idea of what to go on from the upper classes uh, of what's happening here. So we can kind of make some educated guesses in some situations uh, and then fill that in with the, the little result, the little uh, existing records from the peasant groups. Uh, but very quickly, uh, almost as an immediate reaction, the plague hasn't even completely, completely burned itself out yet, and we're going to start seeing some reactions to that. Um, I remember, like we said in the last lecture, there's a, a, a super huge decline in the number of laborers. The labor pool has dropped, and during the pre-plague years, there were laborers, you know, everywhere, and they were cheap because there were so many. Well, now that's not the case. There aren't so many laborers and their wages are climbing. They're able to demand cash wages. Understandably, it uh, doesn't excuse it, but understandably, the nobility, the upper classes, 
they are seeing more and more of their money going to to paying these people, paying their wages. And that's not something that they're very happy about. And so in England in 1351, King Edward III issues a law. Uh, Edward is going to uh, sign off on this. Parliament's going to pass it. It's called the Statute of Laborers. Uh, this does a couple of things. A uh, big thing that it does is all wages are frozen at pre-plague levels. Now, you know, on the surface, okay, whatever. That doesn't sound that much of an issue, but that's at a period when labor was abundant and labor was cheap. And we're not in that situation anymore. The new reality is labor, there's not a lot of laborers, and so their wages, they can demand more money. Uh, that same law, that statute of laborers, also stipulated there's no wandering around the countryside for laborers in uh, by laborers in search of better wages. And so if you can restrict them onto their manner, they're not able to shop around and see who can give them the best deal for selling their labor. Uh, in addition to that stipulation, uh, any non-noble that's traveling around has to wear a badge of their lord saying that they are on official business. So we don't want these people just wandering around and demanding higher and higher wages. We would like to be able to pay them, you know, peanuts like we had in the prepaid plague levels. Uh, and the penalties for uh, engaging in this now criminal action can be pretty severe. Some people are going to be imprisoned. Some people are going to be branded. And so for the crime of trying to do better for your family and yourself, uh, you know, you could result in getting branded or maybe even going to jail. Uh, now, technically, and, and you've got to put a technically in there, unfortunately, technically this is only partially enforced. There are punishments for peasants. Um, there are also punishments for nobility. Nobility are not supposed to pay higher wages. They're not supposed to try to outbid each other. We are doing a, uh, a wage freeze. And if, if somebody, if some members of the nobility start offering more and more money, that messes up the whole thing. Uh, we're, we're engaging in price fixing here. If somebody doesn't go with the system, it screws it up for everybody else. And so technically, like I said, peasants uh, can be punished for this. Technically, nobility can be punished for this. Uh, the local justice of the peace is the one that's going to mete out punishments here. But guess what? Nobility, they outrank, tend to outrank the justice of the peace. Nobility can cause problems for that particular justice of the peace. And so I'm not going to go out and harass the nobility and enforcing this law. Uh, the justice of the peace is really, really only going to focus on the peasantry in enforcing this law because they have no political power. They don't, they have no means to make my life uncomfortable. And so there's no incentive for me you know, there's a disincentive for me to actually enforce the law against the, the nobility. Um, but, you know, since there's a demand for labor and since the nobility is willing to pay for these laborers, even though they are typically, you know, they're technically breaking the law, uh, wages for that, that lower class go up uh, by one estimate between 1340 and 1380 the purchasing power of the so-called third estate. Uh, there's the first, second, and third estate. Those who uh, uh, fought, that's the nobility. Those that prayed, that's the clergy. And those that worked, that's the serf folks. Uh, their purchasing power of, of the serfs and, and those peasantry class increases about 40%. That's a tremendous uh, pay increase for these people. What's well, kind of cool is they can, because they, they, their income has jumped by about 40% over the course of those years, they can now buy goods and services that previously they couldn't do. And so 
we're going to see some upward nobility mobility from the peasantry class. Uh, maybe I can swing an education for my kids. Maybe I can get them an apprenticeship in an actual trade, becoming a blacksmith or a carpenter or a baker or a brewer or maybe even an apothecarist. Uh, that, that's a pharmacist in today's parlance. Uh, we can get our kids out of our station in life. And as a parent, that's always what you want. You want better for your kids than you've had for yourself. And they're able to do that. And uh, that's, again, going to be something scary for the nobility. And uh, one of the more entertaining laws that comes out of these sort of reactions to the, the increased ability to the, of the peasant class is in 1363, uh, we see evidence of what these, what the peasants are, are doing in England again. England is going to pass a law that regulates what the lower classes could wear and what they could own. Uh, a lot of those you know, lower classes, probably not so much serfs, but some of those people that are eking their way out of serfdom, uh, they're buying luxury goods and clothing that previously had only been available to the upper classes. And so those poor people are dressing and looking more and more like nobility and the nobility doesn't want that at all. And so they start restricting what you're allowed to wear and what kind of head coverings that women can wear and stuff because we don't want the poor people looking like us nobles. Uh, on top of that, uh, about 20 years later, um, the peasantry classes, those lower classes, are going to get more and more political and they will flex that political muscle occasionally. And uh, in a really cool one that goes sideways for them is the Peasants' Revolt of 1381. Uh, in a couple of years earlier, in 1377, the government passes a tax, a poll tax. Uh, we want to pay off the debt from the Hundred Years' War. And some people refuse to pay that. The peasantry class, we're, we're having a bit more of a ability to uh, you know, flex our political muscles. And so some, some different localities in England are refusing to pay this poll tax. And in 1381, some representatives go to the village of Kent to look into instances of non-payment among those folks. And the leader up there, this guy is pretty entertaining because he has some decent ideas, but then he just kind of scraps it all. Uh, the leader is a guy named Watt Taylor, W-A-T-T-A-Y-L-E-R. He's the one that leads the revolt, and uh, they start out in Kent, and then they uh, get together a, a bunch of revolutionaries, and then they move on to London. And when they get to London, they free a lot of the prisoners in the Tower of London. Uh, they behead the Archbishop of Canterbury and even kill a few nobles out there on the lawn. Uh, the king, because that's a scary prospect, the king eventually agrees to discuss some terms on, on what, you know, what do these nobles or these revolutionaries want? What does it take to get them to go away? It's always, what, to, what does it take to get them to go away? Watt Taylor has some cool ideas. He demands that they abolish serfdom, that whole idea of, of you being tied to the land of your particular lord. No, we don't want that. We want freedom for people to be able to move around and get jobs or seek their own living. Maybe open your own uh, business. Uh, so he demands that they abolish serfdom. He also demands that the governance of small communities be overseen by those communities. So if we've got a small town uh, of Kent, we would like to govern ourselves. We don't want oversight, for the most part, by the crown. Uh, another thing that we would like, uh, this one's going a little pushing it slightly, but maybe we'll agree to it. Uh, certain hated government officials be handed over for execution. People that are notoriously brutal, uh, that are just overly oppressive. We would like to execute those people. Maybe we'll do that. Uh, and also, finally, the last thing we want is all rebels should be given amnesty. And so everybody that engaged in this revolution, they should not be punished for seeking greater freedoms and more rights for themselves. Uh, Richard starts to 
uh, agree to some of these things. Uh, one of the big things that he does is he immediately abolishes serfdom. He's going to walk that back, but for now, he immediately abolishes serfdom. Uh, the very next day, the king's acquiescing. We can get more stuff out of him. <laughs> uh, the very next day, a really bad move. The rebels are going to demand more things uh, at a meeting the, ne the very next day. And at one of those discussions, Watt Tyler did a terrible thing. <laughs> he referred to the king as brother. Now, you might think that you're my equal, but you're not. And so Watt Tyler refers to the king as brother, and he pushes that even further. In negotiations, never do these things. Uh, he refers to the king as brother, and he says, it's okay with me if from now on that Richard and I consider ourselves friends. Ah, no, <laughs> you're not my friend. You're not my equal. None of that's right. Um, that meeting goes sideways, and it's, it's really unclear exactly what happened. But there was a fight that breaks out, and Watt Tyler's dead. Not a really big surprise there. Uh, the reb rebellion's over. Their leader is dead. And so Richard tries to walk back a lot of those changes. Um, some of them he's going to walk back. Some of them he's not. The rest of the elites are worried that, hey, if we walk back all of those things, there's going to be another revolt. And so we're not really sure we should kind of back everything off. Uh, he does uh, remove his uh, proclamation that serfdom was abolished. Uh, we're still going to have legal serfdom, but it's going to go into decline. And a big reason it goes into decline is that some landowners, uh, some landowners start becoming more and more cash poor. They still have their property. They still have, you know, the uh, agricultural products that their serfs are putting out, but they don't have actual hard currency. And so to get hard currency in, in an uncomfortable way, uh, they are going to take payments from some of their serfs to purchase those serfs' freedom. So you can buy your way out of serfdom. And if your particular lord is having a rough enough time, you can purchase your freedom. Uh, in the coming years, coming decades, wages are going to continue to increase. Serfs are going to do a bit better. Um, and so we're going to see some political shifts that, that really are talked more, uh, more of in your textbook. But a big thing is we're seeing some accountability from everybody. Uh, used to be it was just the nobles that were accountable, that, you know, they were the ultimate power and everybody was held accountable to them. But as we see with the peasants' revolt, revolt uh, sometimes you've got those people that are kind of on the bottom and, and they're demanding more things from their nobles. And if they don't get them, they will go and behead a few people. And so we're going to see a little bit of move on that issue with, uh, with the, the lower classes having more political power, more purchasing power. Uh, all around. And so we're heading, heading towards some massive, massive changes in Europe, really uh, as a result of the plague. Uh, lots of things are changing. So uh, we'll see you next time.